So we're looking at uh, Richard Borkham's book, uh, Jesus and the Eyewitness, uh, the Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony, Richard Borkham, 2006, Erdna. And we've looked at quite a bit about papyrus. We've looked at um, the difference between oral tradition and oral historians. And we need to just think about papyrus again. In page 14, uh, Borkham writes about papyrus. This makes the particular passage from Papias very precious evidence of the way in which the gospel traditions were understood to be related to the eyewitness at, um, at the very time when the other, at the very time when the canonical gospels were being written, the canonical, canonical gospels were being written. So the fact that Papias saw the living voice, the interviewing of individual eyewitnesses as vital um, is strong evidence to suggest that the gospels when they were being written also wanted to interview or look at it from the perspective of the living eyewitnesses of the time this historian The way um, Papias thought of history is the same as he thought as the same kind of history that Polybius thought, and also um, the Sidides. Um, historians' strict, strict principle of historiography were like those of the Sidides, something of an idea for later historians. Uh, which wanted to claim uh, a practice. So let, let's just uh, get some information about This is on a site called Ancient Greece. The city is, was a Greek historian who was born in Alamos between the year 460 and 455 BC and died between 411 and 4 BC. He is known for his book, The History of the Peloponnesian War, which details the war between Sparta and Athens in the 5th century. As with many authors of that time, much of the information we know about him comes from this, his sole work, where we gain our views of his personality and his thoughts. On the leaders of Athens. Thucydides was an Athenian aristocrat who is to believe that in his late twenties or early thirties when the war first broke out in 431 BC. Thucydides famously described to us the plague of Athens in 430 BC. This is on uh, Ancient History Source Book. Uh, there's a massive article um, which I'll link to it. Um, We'll just read a bit of this. Uh, Thucydides, Athenian historian, materials for his biography are scanty. The facts of interest chiefly are as aids to the appreciation of his, of his lab life's labour, the history of the Peloponnesian War. The older view that he was probably born in about 471 BC is based on a passage of Aulus uh, Gellius, who say that in 431 Hellenesius seems to have been uh, 65 years of age. Herodotus 53 and Thucydides 40. The authority of this statement was uh, Pamphila, a woman of Greek extraction, 
who compile biographical and historical notices in the reign of Nero. The value of uh, testimony is negligible and modern criticism inclines to a later date, about 460. Thucydides' father, Olerus, a citizen of Athens, belonged to a family which derived wealth and influence with the possession of gold mines at Scatile on the Thracian coast opposite Thessal, and was a relative of his elder namesake, the Thracian prince, whose daughter, uh, Hegespile, married the great Metidides. So the Simon, son of Metius, was possibly a connection of Thucydides. Um, so we'll, we'll just get um, Fordham University is a good uh, source. I'll 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 link to I'll link to um, Papias and uh, the cities. The cities, um sources so that you can research yourself. Um, we'll just see. The city is the Pen 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 Peloponnesian War on Historical Method. Um, the history of the Peloponnesian War by uh, the city is 460 to 500 BC is considered by many to be the first history without myths. It is the story of the war between Athens and its allies against Sparta, its allies which tore the Greek world in the 5th century. Thucydides was an Athenian general, but when he was exiled for losing a battle, he began his history of the war. The following excerpt, he describes his method of writing. He says, having now given the results, this is the Greek historian, having now given the results of my inquiries into early times, I grant that there will be a difficulty in believing every particular detail. The way that most men deal with traditions, even traditions of their own country, is to receive them all alike as they are delivered without applying any critical test whatsoever. The general Athenian public fancied that Hipparchus was tyrant when he when he fell by the hands of Armadius and Aristogiton, not knowing that Happius, the eldest of the sons of the Pisistratus, was really supreme, and that Hipparchus and Thassalus were his brothers, and that Harmodius and Aristogiton, suspecting on the very day, nay, at the very moment fixed on for the deed, that information had been conveyed to Happius by their accomplices, and concluded that he had been warned and did not attack him, yet not liking to be apprehended and risk their lives for nothing, fell upon Hipparchus near the temple of the daughter of Leos and slew him as he was arranging the Panathenaic procession. There are many other unfounded currents among the rest of Hellenes, even on matters of contemporary history, which have not obs would have not been obs obscured by time. For instance, there is the notion that the Lacedaemonian kings have two votes each, the fact being that they have only one, and that there is a company of Pitten, there being simple no such thing. 
So little pains do the vulgar take in the investigation of truth, except in readily the first story that comes to hand. On the whole, however, the conclusions I have drawn from proofs quoted may, I believe, safely be relied on. Assuredly, they will not be dis disturbed either by the lays of a poet displaying the exaggeration of his craft, or by the compositions of the chroniclers that are attracted at, attractive to truth's expense. The suspects they treat of being out of reach of evidence, and of time having robbed most of them historical value, by enthroning them on the region of legend. Turning from these, we can rest satisfied with having proceeded upon the clearest data, and having arrived at conclusions as exact as can be expected in mat matters of such antiquity. So, as you can see, it goes on um, that basically he's, 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 he's done his historical inquiry as careful as he can, sifting the evidence, looking at the best evidence that he can get. And it's that kind of methodology, that kind of attention to detail, that when the Gospels were being written, that's the kind of historiography that these Gospels were influenced by. Um, Bochum says what Papias says does not agree with what the scholars say he says Papias belong roughly to speaking to the third Christian generation therefore to a generation that had been in contact with the first Christian generation the generation of the apostles he was personally acquainted with the daughters of Philip the evangelist the Philippi was one of the twelve, uh, which you can find in Acts chapter 21, 8, 9. So what um, Borkham is saying, I've laboured it quite a lot, is basically saying, look, I think he's saying, um, we've, we've I think what he's saying is we've not taken seriously the Gospels and we're not taking seriously people like Papias. When, if we looked at their historical context and the language that they are using, they're quite clearly basing what they are doing on the way ancient historians wrote. He even notes that even the Gnostics claimed the same kind of methodology um, Irenaeus noted that the Gnostics claimed that they had oral transmission of information about Jesus obviously we, uh, I don't when you look at those claims it's obvious that their claims are not founded um, but it does back up this point that even in even the Gnostics there was a general belief that if you were going to do history you had to do it in a certain way um, just an aside though the Gnostics were not even though they claimed to have got their ideas from uh, eyewitness accounts uh, is quite clear that that's a fabrication uh, in the Gnostics because when you compare their understanding of um, Jerusalem for example the Gnostic writers don't have any understanding what Jerusalem's like in the first century so uh, you know they're, they're not accurate so I suppose that if we're going to believe in eyewitness material, it, that the fact that we, that people are saying that this is eyewitness material, it has to have some kind of historical veracity and consistency. Uh, this is all on page 33.
He notes on page 34, James D. Dunn regards history as memory and eyewitness, a collective memory. Just a, a, an aside there. Okay, that's uh, pay up to page 35. Um, we'll finish off Borkham and um, 